Welcome to Backyard Invasives, and this is the second webinar that is being hosted by the Southeastern Vermont Cooperative Invasive Species Management Association, the Southeastern Vermont CISMA. We are a new group that is um, has steering committee me uh, members from lots of different organizations in southeastern Vermont as well as consulting foresters. So we have a lot of different types of representation that are in the southeastern Vermont CISMA. If you are interested in contacting us, you can see that we have Gmail, um, Southeast Vermont CISMA at gmail.com. We also have just recently launched a Facebook page and you can follow us on Facebook and either post questions about things that you're seeing and wondering about or follow uh, posts that we're making about upcoming events and other um, invasive topics that come up as we start to move along as a group. So for tonight's presentation, um, I'm going to to have a chance to introduce our presenters. And then our presenters are going to be talking about what are invasive plants in the context of your backyard? What makes a plant invasive versus non-invasive? And what context are we talking about it for tonight's presentation? We're going to then go over about seven common backyard invasives that you may see. How do I buy native or non-invasive ornamental plants? talk about upcoming webinars, and then we're going to spend most of the evening talking about questions and answers so that you have a chance to ask your invasive questions and our panel um, will have a chance to weigh in on what they may be able to share around that question. So our presenters tonight, so I forgot to introduce myself. I should have done that right away. My name is Margot Gia, and I'm the Natural Resources Planner at Wyndham Regional Commission. And we also have Jack Minich, which, who is the Land Management Coordinator at Vermont Land Trust. Rachel Klisch, a biologist with Silvio Conte National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Peter Van Loan, Lead Forester from Vermont Land Trust and Corey Ross, the District Manager of the Wyndham County Natural Resources Conservation District. So our first uh, presenter this evening is going to be Rachel. Thank you, Margo. So we did cover what are non-native invasive plants in our first webinar in this series. But for those of you who haven't watched that webinar, we wanted to make sure that folks understood what we meant when we are talking about non-native invasive plants. So non-native invasive plants are non-native species, uh, usually from a different country, that are introduced into a new location by human activity, either intentionally or by accident, and they are capable of moving aggressively into a habitat and taking over that habitat to the detriment of other species. These species are um, introduced through horticultural activities, um, and this may be because it has a pretty flower like purple loose strife, through conservation activities such as knotweed, um, which was introduced for erosion control, and then um, also accidentally, for example, uh, Japanese siltgrass was used as packing material in the 1800s for imports from China. So the CISMA is a great resource um, if you have questions about invasives or concerns, but there are also other resources online, including vermontinvasives.org, which is a, a resource that can help you uh, obtain more information about invasives in Vermont. And you can also report an invasive plant. Go Botany is another resource, and that one is great for identifying uh, native and non-native plants. And iNaturalist is another resource um, where you can join a community and have great conversations about nature and also um, be able to report and track invasive plants. So we wanted to briefly introduce you to some common backyard invasives in, in Vermont. 
And Jack and, and Peter um, took a walk in Brattleboro and they walked about a four block area um, and took a glance in people's backyards and um, identified some invasive plants and um, mapped um, some of these plants within that general area. And so as we go through the presentation, you're gonna see a map that's associated with each species that we're talking about. And on that map, you're gonna see a point where this here is, here for gout weed, there's a plus sign, but the others will have points as to where those invasive plants were found. So gout weed is one of those plants. Um, gout weed is often planted in um, the perennial gardens. And if they escape, if the plant escapes, you'll see it in wooded areas, edges of yards, sidewalks, and parking areas. So gout weed is originally from Europe and Asia, and it was, it was actually introduced to um, the United States through as an ornamental. Uh, people planted it as a ground cover and also as a medicinal, medicinal herb. And it, it spread from these gardens into our natural areas. And another way that it is introduced into our natural areas um, and throughout any of your backyard is through a lawn clippings. Um, this species will um, root from rhizomes and just a piece of the plant will create other plants. This species is shade tolerant. And so you will uh, find it in um, under the forest, forested habitat, and it mainly spreads by rhizomes. The leaves, um, the, the type that's of gout weed that is often planted um, is known as gout weed. Um, that's often planted before it's bluish green leaves with white edges or, and it's very pretty. And there's also another um, species that's entirely green. The leaves are, have nine leaflets divided into nine leaflets and the flowers are small white umbels on a tall stalk and they bloom in June to July. And this species does spread aggressively um, and once it's established, it is very hard to get rid of. So some native alternatives for, for gout weed include uh, golden Alexander, which has a very pretty yellow flower. It looks very similar to gout weed. Um, Canadian anemone as a white flower and wild sarsaparilla. So these species are certainly um, very pretty, but also provide habitat for our native pollinators. Um, I have Golden Alexander is planted in a native pollinator plant um, garden um, here at the office in Brunswick, Vermont. And it's, it's always being utilized by various um, pollinators such as bees and wasps and um, butterflies and, and moths. So another species that Jack and Peter found um, was Asiatic bittersweet or Oriental bittersweet. So this is, you can see this uh, as yellow dots on the map. This is a climbing, this is a, a vine and it climbs the vegetation. Um, near edges of wood, wooded areas, parking lots, yards, and sidewalks. And it is also shade tolerant and will also climb trees within wooded areas. So bittersweet is originally from East Asia and it was introduced as an ornamental. This species is also very um, common, um, commonly used as fall decoration. It has very pretty I red and orange berries and people like to make wreaths out of it and put it on their doors. And when the wreath is disposed of, it, um, wherever it is disposed, you will also have um, bittersweet growing. So that's another way that it can be introduced into an area. So it is a vine that climbs by twining around trees and other vegetation or anything that it comes across. And the leaves are light green and alternate. The, it does have some flowers, but they're not as showy as the, um, as the, as the, the bright yellow and orange red fruit. 
that are scattered on the stem. And it can reach the heights of 60 plus feet, which can topple trees and also smother vegetation. And it does spread rapidly by seed and root suckers and is a very hard invasive to get rid of. So if you want to learn more about this invasive or any other um, invasive that we um, will be talking about today, uh, we don't have all YouTube videos, but we do have some videos of, of some of them. Um, so if you go to Wyndham County Conservation District uh, webpage, you'll see some YouTube videos about on various invasives where we discuss the some identification characteristics for, of each species. And we'll be adding more to that as we go along. Some alternatives to Asiatic bittersweet um, is Virginia creeper, which um, this photo here shows it in the fall with very pretty blueberries and uh, some red leaves. Uh, coral honeysuckle or trumpet vine is another um, good alternative. It's also a woody vine. And I did put American bittersweet um, in this slide. I don't know a lot about American bittersweet, but, but you, this bittersweet looks very similar to um, Asiatic bittersweet. The key characteristic um, difference is that the berries are at the very end of the stems rather than scattered along the stems. The berries look very similar as they are orange and red as well, but they are it is not native to Vermont, but it is native to North America. And I believe the next slide is Glossy Buckthorn, which I will turn over to Peter. All right, thanks, Rachel. Uh, so for those of you who live in the Connecticut River Valley, uh, Glossy Buckthorn is probably fairly familiar to you. Uh, it's pretty much everywhere in Rockingham, Dummerston, Brattleboro, Vernon, and uh, across the river in New Hampshire and down into Massachusetts. Um, if you're out in a more, uh, a little further away from the Connecticut River Valley, you might be starting to see a little bit. It'll show up in edges of yards um, along uh, roads and, and wet areas. Um, <clears throat> seeds are, are spread pretty far um, by birds, and so you'll often find them in places under where birds are perching. Um, you can see that we found a few of them here in the uh, for a for, excuse me for block area that we uh, walked in Brattleboro, most of them were just a few plants that uh, were seeds that probably were rolling down the road and land, ended in, in a crack in a sidewalk or the road and started started up. There's not a lot actually right in downtown, but when you get further out to the edges of town, there's quite a bit. Um, so let's look a little bit at how to identify this one if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's a native of North Africa and uh, Europe and Asia. In Europe, they actually use it <clears throat> um, to make hedges and sort of a, a living fence. They'll grow it really tightly together and sort of weave it together to make a fence to keep livestock in. Um, here, uh, they, they brought it here for that and also for its purported wildlife value, these, these berries that you see. Uh, it, as it turns out, those berries um, have a laxative in them, so the actual value to wildlife is very low. It's kind of like junk food for wildlife. Um, if you're looking up uh, glossy buckthorn, the picture of the leaves you see will probably be something like what's in the upper right-hand corner fairly rounded, uh, very glossy, um, alternate leaf pattern, um, sort of curving uh, veins in the leaf. On the top, it's uh, glossy and underneath, it's a little bit hairy, has really sh short hairs. Um, so remembering those characteristics is really important when you're trying to differentiate between this and some of the native lookalikes that we'll see in the next slide. But before we go there, I just wanted to point out that although the, the picture in the upper right is sort of typical glossy buckthorn, the picture in the bottom right shows three different glossy buckthorn plants and those leaves are all fairly different. Some of them, like the middle one is pretty pointy. Uh, the one on the left has really dark green and maybe a little bit rounder. 
leaves, leaves of all different sizes. So um, you just have to sort of key yourself into those, those characteristic ID factors like smooth, smooth edge on the uh, untoothed edge on the leaf, alternate branching, that sort of thing. So the, uh, the, the fruits we've already talked about, um, they start out, as you see in the, in the middle picture, they start out sort of yellowish, and then as they mature, uh, they turn red and eventually end up sort of blue-black. Um, the, uh, the buckthorn name comes from a, a sort of false thorn that you can see in the picture furthest left, which is a blow-up of the center picture. There's a little tiny so-called thorn. It's actually really soft. You'd be hard-pressed to get hurt by that thorn. Um, but that's where it gets its name. Uh, the roots are, are reddish. The, the fine feeder roots are very yellow. Um, and the, the bark, as you can see in the middle there, um, has uh, sort of white lenticels and sort of a, I don't know, what would you call that, a brownie gray bark. Um, and the seeds are moved, as we said, by wildlife, but they're also by water because they'll float. So if it's growing along a river or a wetland with an outlet, that's a good place to go after it and get rid of it so it doesn't spread uh, down from there. So in the next slide, we'll see the native lookalikes and native and some alternatives. The one on the left, speckled alder. The stem looks very much the same, but if, as you can see by the leaf, the veins are really straight. The leaf is also finely serrated. There are really fine teeth along there. Um, if you look at the two dogwoods, they are opposite branched, not alternate branched. Their leaves look somewhat similar in turn of, terms of their veination and their shape, but their branching is different. And then uh, the Choke cherry in the bottom right um, is fairly similar to the um, buckthorn as well, but it's a little hard to see in this picture, but there, there are fine teeth along the edge of the leaf, so that <clears throat> helps you uh, distinguish between them. Um, I would say the choke cherry, silky dogwood, red osier dogwood, those are all great alternatives. Um, as you can see by the red osier dogwood picture that I took on our property in West Brattleboro, they are a favorite of deer. So if you put them in there um, in your yard, you might get visited by deer. Uh, and I think Jack's going to take on the next species. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, as you'll notice, immediately on the map, Japanese barbie is another very common species um, in our very small plot. Um, usually what you'll, where you'll find it is edges of parks and wooded areas. It's very shade tolerant. Um, if you love to recreate out in the woods, it's pretty likely that you'll come across it if you're in Wyndham County or the region. Um, how it presents uh, as an ornamental in people's yards is most often as hedgerows or as ornamental bushes. Origin, as the name suggests, Japan. Its introduction, uh, it's an herbarium escapee from the mid-1800s, and it's also been sold um, it may continue to be sold, although I don't see it too often in our region um, as an ornamental. It is a woody perennial shrub with arching thorny branches. So you'll often see uh, these, these many branches kind of flowing out of a center branch, or I shouldn't say center branch, but out of a center. Um, and keys for IDing it, and once you know how to ID it, it's very easy to spot it. Um, you've got these light green, smooth edged or untoothed leaves um, that are often in these world clusters. Um, and you'll see it, especially this time of year and into the winter, uh, as its fruit matures, these red dangling berries. Um, and I guess maybe, so we do have, I see someone inserted the YouTube link. There is a YouTube link for this species as well on the Wyndham County Natural Resources Conservation District web page. So if you navigate to that page, you can find the YouTube link showing how to identify it. Um, some native alternatives, which I think there's another slide, so we'll get to that. Um, it's good to note there are um, a couple other kind of aesthetics to this plant. 
There's a variant of Japanese Barberry um, that has a slightly different look. It's called Rose Glow. This one's pretty common too. Um, basically, Rose Glow is, as a variant, kind of emphasizes what uh, the ornamental value of Japanese Barberry really is, which is its bright foliage. In the fall, it stands out as a very pretty plant as the leaves start to turn. Um, and if, if you start looking for this past uh, leaf off, you'll, you'll most likely see it in this form over here to the right, which is these, these bright red berries contrasted against tons and tons of these branches. And then some native alternatives. Um, you've got low bush and high bush blueberries. They'll have similar foliage effects in your yard. Um, and Northern Bayberry is also a good alternative. Um, and these alternatives will also kind of meet a wildlife food need um, through berries. And I think it's back to Peter. Thanks, Jack. So the next one is burning bush. As you can see, this is also a favorite for urban plantings. Um, uh, somebody asked for the Latin name as well. This one's Euonymus elatus. Um, it's fairly common in, as an ornamental planting, hedgerows, um, maybe on the edge of somebody's, or the corner of somebody's house or something like this. You can see me in the picture in the middle, pulling one out at the land trust office in Woodstock when we did an invasives control workshop back in 2009. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how to identify it. It's pretty easy. I mean, the reason why it's uh, planted is for that bright red foliage that you see in the two bottom slides or bottom pictures, excuse me. And, you know, a lot when I talk to people, they generally don't think that this is terribly invasive. But if you look at what's happening on the edge of Route 121 in Cambridgeport there, you'll have to admit that it's pretty invasive. Uh, it's generally sort of a, in shrub form, although it can get pretty tall. I've seen it in Bennington as sort of a sapling tree, 25 feet tall and three inches in diameter, kind of crazy stuff. Um, it's really easy to identify by the sort of corky wings that you see in the two top pictures. Um, the leaves are opposite. Uh, arranged opposite, have very fine uh, teeth and taper at both ends. Uh, once you see it, it's it's hard not to recognize it. it it's a really heavy cedar. So uh, in the bottom right picture, what likely happened was a few plants got started and because there are so many seeds, it tr drops a tremendous amount right underneath it and whatever the mice and other things, who might, birds who might eat it, whatever they don't get to sprouts. And suddenly you have this profusion of winged euonymus or burning bush growing in the woods. Um, the next slide has some uh, native alternatives. Again, um, high bush blueberry is a great one. I like it because it's got a little bit of local food too. And then on the right is winterberry. It doesn't have the, the uh, really bright foliage um, that the high bush blueberry has, uh, but the the, um, the berries, the bright red berries, are great for wildlife, and they hang on into the winter, so they're often a, a food resource when food is otherwise pretty scarce. And I think it's back to Jack now. The next one's black swallowwort. Um, where it is in the urban landscape, it's mostly. Areas with lots of disturbed soil, so near parking lots, construction sites, and mode, Department of Transportation right-of-ways. Um, but you'll also find it in edges between lawns and gardens, places with bare soil. Um, and it can be fairly shape tolerant, so you can also easily find it popping out of bushes um, and places where, where you didn't necessarily expect to see a plant take hold. Origin is Southwest Europe. Also, like Japanese barberry and others, it's an herbarium escapee from the mid-1800s. Seeds were available online, I guess, for a time, um, although I've, I've never heard of it being planted intentionally. It's an herbaceous, unbranched perennial vine. And for identification, look for dark green opposite or kind of paired along the stem. Smooth-edged leaves, so untoothed, um, in 
the spring and summer, you'll see it with uh, these small dark purple flowers. Um, and into the fall, you'll see these milky looking smooth green seed pods. Um, and this photo may make it look a little bit bigger than they usually are, but they can be pretty small too. Um, and for native alternatives, if you, if you have this in your, in your yard and it's serving an ornamental purpose, which would be really interesting if it was, uh, and you wanted to replace it with a native, uh, it would be fairly similar to the Asiatic bittersweet. You'd be looking for things like American bittersweet, um, some of the clematis varieties, uh, coral honeysuckle and Virginia creeper would serve that viney purpose. So this one's me again, uh, Norway maple. Uh, Norway maple is really tolerant of bad growing conditions and lots of salt. So it has been planted all over the place as an urban tree. And it's pretty much escaped everywhere that it has, it has been planted um, in that way. And you can see how many there are here in this little four block area in Brattleboro. And there are some green patches that don't have blue spots, but I suspect if we actually walked around there, we would find it. Um, this one is Acer platinoides. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how to identify it. It's a really easy one to identify. Um, if you see a maple tree that has sort of a classic maple leaf, looks like a sugar leaf, sugar maple leaf, but it has bark that looks like an ash tree, that's a Norway maple. Another key is uh, if you break the petiole or the stem of the leaf, there's a little white uh, milky sap that will come out there. Uh, it leaves out really early and it holds its leaves until late. When I got to the office today, uh, I looked around, all the sugar maples are orange. The Norway maples are still pretty much green. There's a little bit of yellow showing on the edges, but they haven't really even started to turn yet. Um, like I said, they're, they're really hardy, which is one of the reasons why they were so popular and why they were planted so much. They have really nice foliage in the fall. Uh, there are various cultivars. Some of them have sort of a, a purplish leaf. Um, they put out a tremendous amount of seed, as you can see in that bottom picture. Um, they are, are winged seeds, so they're dispersed by the wind. They're very shade tolerant, uh, so they can, uh, dis they can outcompete sugar maple and other native maples when they escape into the woods. Uh, and so native alternatives, if you've got one of these, is any other maple, pretty much. Um, if you've got a mature one, that's going to be a little hard to deal with. If you've got, But what I noticed walking around uh, the streets of Brattleboro is there are a lot of little ones, a lot of little saplings. And so something like a weed wrench or something like that could take care of those pretty quickly. That was sort of a quick tour through the ones that we found as we did our our little four block area survey. Some other, com some other ones that you might see, they're not terribly common, some of them, but they may show up in your yard. Um, lesser celandine is sort of a, a low growing ground cover. Uh, it's something, my, my mother-in-law got it uh, in a plant that she got from a neighbor of hers, and now it's pretty much taken over uh, about half of her yard. Um, common buckthorn is very much like uh, glossy buckthorn. Um, yellow flag iris is one that's, uh, again, a lot of people don't think is terribly invasive, but boy, if it gets into a wetland, it can really take over. It spreads really aggressively through a big rhizome or root mat and also through seeds, and kind of like uh, Japanese knotweed. If it tears away from a, a river and floats downstream and lands somewhere, you have a whole new population again. Um, bush honeysuckle, I think probably most people are familiar with. Um, garlic mustard, uh, very common around here, especially along roadsides and disturbed areas. The, uh, the leaves smell and taste like garlic. Um, it's generally uh, flowering pretty early in the spring. It's one of the first things to pop up and turn green. Spotted knapweed, as you can see, looks kind of like a little tiny thistle. It's not terribly common around here, but it's super aggressive. 
uh, puts out a lot of seeds that are actually um, fairly long lasting despite their tiny size. Um, so they can take over fields and open areas pretty quickly, even sort of more open forested areas. Purple loosestrife, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that by now. The amazing thing about purple loosestrife is a single plant can put out millions of seeds, which is just staggering. I thought that had to be wrong the first time I read it, but it just keeps showing up. Must be true. Common reed or phragmites is another one that you'll probably have seen. Uh, very common in wetland areas and disturbed areas like roadsides. It's fairly common that if a road crew is doing uh, some repair on the side of the road, they may bring in some fill that has this stuff in it. It again uh, spreads fairly aggressively through rhizomes, but also through seed. Japanese knotweed, I think everybody's probably familiar with that one. Um, another one that was sort of ironically brought in for its benefits of stream bank stabilization, but in fact, it doesn't stabilize the streams, it destabilizes them. Um, sort of a new one to me in the last few years is wall lettuce. I don't know if folks are seeing this around. It can take a variety of forms. It can be kind of uh, spindly, maybe 18 to 24 inches tall in a, in a really dense um, hardwood forest or softwood forest for that matter. Um, but if you get it growing out in the open right up against a wall, which is stone wall, which it often does, it often grows in those conditions. That's where it got its name. It can be five or six feet tall, puts out tons of seeds. And again, they're fairly long lasting. And the last one here is Dame's Rocket, sometimes called False Flocks. Uh, you'll see this one pretty early in the spring along uh, roadsides. Uh, if you're tempted to dig something up on the roadside, be really careful that you know exactly what it is. This stuff here uh, is in the same family as garlic mustard and is similarly aggressive, has some of the same characteristics like allelopathy, so it sort of poisons the soil, so other things can't grow there, native plants can't grow there. Uh, you wouldn't want to have this in your backyard. And I think the next one is Jax. Sure, so kind of zooming out and talking broadly about what we mean when we're talking about backyard invasives, you can see on the map here, um, all of our points together. So we, th those are only about seven species. Obviously, you'll see more plus signs than there were for the Goutweed, that Goutweed uh, slide. We kind of ran out of different different points we could take in the app we were using. So those, those are other invasive species that we identified in our four block radius. Um, and I, I really like this slide because it, it illustrates how if everyone has just one plant in their yard or if everyone has a neighbor with just one plant, um, the compounding effect of that can lead to a pretty sizable population in a given area. Um, and while you may be really concerned about what's coming over into your yard or maybe spilling into your neighbors, um, even thinking more broadly, this is serving as a seed source or as a source of a, another type of propagule to spread into natural areas that you might like to recreate in or that you might find um, very healing to go and visit um, and it spreading potentially is uh, a, a seed source for, um, you know, cross state boundaries or, or cross county lines. Um, but there is, there is a reason to be really positive about it, especially in the urban landscape perspective, because everyone's dealing with such a small scale of land usually. Usually it's just right outside their door and they can walk it in a minute or two. Um, that's a great reason to hope that when you all learn the plants that you um, could be encountering and you learn maybe some of the management techniques that on your small scale you can make a really outsized impact if you're able to coordinate with your neighbors, if you're able to coordinate with um, your block or even like, you know, this small neighborhood in Brattleboro, if people are able to get together and find a way to share resources that can have a really large impact and help contain the spread of invasive plants elsewhere in Vermont and the region. So now that you know about all the things that you don't want in your backyard and why they're bad, 
Um, you may be wondering, you know, how do I go about picking plants to plant in my yard and making sure that they are uh, not invasive or, or hopefully native if they can be, but at least aren't something that's going to escape from my yard and, and impact my neighbors and impact the woods near me. Um, so I didn't want to miss a chance to tell you about the Conservation District plant sale. And so the Conservation District hosts an annual plant sale every year in the spring. We sell um, entirely non-invasive, primarily native plant species. Um, it's a high quality stock and it's uh, sold very affordably. It's, it's a very small fundraiser for the district. Um, you can't really find these prices anywhere else in my experience. Um, best way to find out about it is to sign up for the Conservation District newsletter. And I just put that link into the chat box if you wanna sign up for that newsletter. Um, that order form, we're hoping to have that out in early December this year, and then the sale itself will be either late April or early May. So order ahead, and then there'll be a pickup day, a Saturday where you'll come pick up your plants and take a home and plant them. And then before we move into the question and answer answer portion of this evening's program, wanted to take a moment to remind you about the upcoming webinars. We have four more of these scheduled. Um, those are all posted on the Conservation District webpage. Those, we, we were able to upgrade a Zoom account for the Conservation District, so there's no limit on the number of people who can register for those or whether there's a 500 person limit. So I think effectively there's no limit, but we would encourage you to sign up for those ahead of time. Um, and we would love to hear what you thought of the, the webinar and um, give us some suggestions for future webinars and also other things the CISMA might engage in. And there is a link for an online survey where you can give us some feedback. Thanks. Margaret, do you want to handle the question and answer? See, I can. I noticed that the, um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here so that we can see our presenters. We've had a very active chat box during this um, presentation. And I think there's been a lot of questions. I unfortunately was not able to be monitoring the chat box because I was sharing my screen, but I suspect that some of our other participants, and we also have some guests who are very knowledgeable that we're also sharing their expertise and thank you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can either wave your hand or you can type it in the chat now and I will be seeing those um, questions now. Okay, so I will see right here at the in the chat, I am seeing a question, bush honeysuckle removal process and alternative suggestions. Well, it depends a little bit on the size of the plant, obviously. Um, if you get to it early, you can hand pull it. Um, if it's a little bit more established, you might have to do something like uh, a weed wrench, or I know folks with big ones, they've used a truck or a tractor and a chain to around it to pull them out. Um, if you've got a, a lot of it in a big area, then I suggest you get in touch with somebody and consider a chemical application of some sort. Um, the thing about when you have really heavy, really dense invasive infestations, if you try to tackle it by hand, if it's a really big area, you're gonna get really frustrated. It's gonna be really hard to actually get control. Whereas if you hire a professional who knows really well how to do this stuff, knows how to do it using the, the least amount of chemical possible to be really effective, they can control it. Usually 90% of it will get controlled the first time and then you've got something that you can tackle and you can handle. So it, again, it depends a little bit on the size of your honeysuckle and the size of your honeysuckle patch, but there are a number of things you, you can do. Um, what are the suggestions to get rid of invasives? Spray? So there was also, a, um, they also asked for that other question about alternatives, I believe, for honeysuckle. I just thought I'd follow up on that. Um, so dogwood uh, would be an, an alternative, maybe blueberry, uh, winterberry, um, maybe some cherry, like choke cherry, things like that. I think those would be good alternatives that are native species. What are the suggestions to get rid of invasives? So I will mention uh, before we jump into that, deep into that, we do have two upcoming webinars. One is on non-chemical uh, controls for invasive species. And then we also have one coming up about chemical treatments and when they should be applied or not. So if you want more in depth about, you know, 
treatments, we will be addressing that. Um, but who wants to address maybe the general? It's, it's a little hard to say. You can't really say that there's one thing or another. There's, you know, all those things that I mentioned are possibilities. You can also try repeated cutting. You can try pulling. But you really have to know the biology of the plant and how it grows to know how to be really effective. So if you have small honeysuckle or, or buckthorn, you can pull those pretty easily. If you have small oriental bittersweet and you pull that, what you're gonna end up with is a ton more oriental bittersweet because there are little buds along all the root nodes. And when you pull that main plant, all those are gonna flush. And so instead of having one big plant, you're suddenly gonna have a hundred little ones. So you have to understand a little bit about the plant, how it grows, um, and the, uh, the vtinvasives.org website that um, Rachel mentioned earlier is really a great one. They've got a whole uh, gallery of invaders, they call it. And if you click on the picture of the one you're interested in, in sort of the upper right-hand corner of the page, is uh, or usually there are, are two buttons. One is a fact sheet that will tell you all about the plant itself and give you some ideas on how to control it. And then there is a button just for treatment options. And that one shows you when it flushes, when it's flowering, and when various different types of control will be most effective. So uh, keep that vtinvasives.org website bookmarked on your computer and your phone. That's a really handy one. Okay, so um, there's another question. And uh, Jack, maybe, I don't know if you want to um, address this one. I figured you'd ask. <laughs> um, do you know which question I'm going to I ask? I do um, Is this Chris? Uh, yes. And the question is, would anybody please tell us more about the Southeast Vermont SISMA? Is there a board? Or a leader? Uh, so the Southeast Vermont SISMA, like a lot of other SISMAs around uh, Vermont and the country, is run with a pretty horizontal leadership structure. It's really just a partnership of nonprofits, engaged public citizens, um, and we also have representation from uh, state and federal partners. Um, and there isn't necessarily a board. There's a steering committee in this early phase to try and figure out how to best connect with you all um, and how to best uh, kind of share our resources to um, bring programming like this to you all. So I hope that answers your question, Chris. And one of the things that we'd really love to hear from you about is what are the resources that you think are missing? What are the things that you would really like to have that maybe we could provide for you at some point. Do pieces of the honeysuckle roots re-sprout? Uh, I think if you get most of the roots, it probably won't re-sprout. What do you think, Tom? I mean, I, I think if you wanted to clone it, you probably could. But, um, you know, if you hand pull it and there's a little piece in there, it's probably not going to do anything. It's not like it doesn't... Um, reproduce that way like frag or not weed would right um so i would say it's pretty low yeah thanks uh so another question relating to honeysuckle i'm using the cut and stump treatment for honeysuckle and common buckthorn with 18 percent glyphosate is that okay i'm not sure we have anyone on this webinar who's qualified to answer that with the exception of maybe Tom, who is a certified pesticide applicator. So if Tom wants to answer it, he can. If he wants to not answer it, that's fine too. Um, we are gonna, like uh, Margo and Corey said, we do have a webinar coming up in a month or so where we're gonna have a certified pesticide applicator talk about chemical uh, control. Uh, Tom, do you wanna take this or demur? Yeah, sure. It's um. You have to look at how much active ingredient you have. So if you're saying 18% is your application concentration, um, the chemical I use, Rodeo, has a 53% active ingredient. So I think about that as like being, you know, the concentrates 100, and then you, you cut that 50% with water. So I apply at a 50% concentration, but really it's at like a 25 
So you want to be taking your concentrate and cutting it in half and doing a 50-50 mix. That makes sense. Thank you for jumping in there, Tom. That was very helpful. We have a question from Steve. How can one deal with spotted knapweed? That's one I haven't dealt with a lot. I did run into a small patch of it on a piece of family land, and we spent the better part of a morning digging it, but it was a fairly small patch and we were pretty careful to try to get all the roots and to dig outside the area where we could see the plants were to make sure we were getting all the root pieces. Um, I'm not sure about control um, outside of uh, digging or, or hand pulling. Um, so I think if you <laughs> yeah, go Tom is Tom. raising his hand. I've, I've done a lot of treatment in napweed. Um, we spray it with a 5% solution um, and water and a, a surfactant that's called AquaChem 90, which is just, there were some questions in the chat about Roundup earlier, and they mix their own, they have a pre-mixed surfactant in there that's really made for like grass. So if you're buying that off the shelf of tractor supply, um, it's really not intended to kill woody species and like invasive plants. Um, so the rodeo product with a, a much stronger surfactant um, sprayed in that 5% concentration as a foliar solution before it flowers. So early in the season to sort of capture that um, plant before it sets seed and makes your life worse um, is the best time to do that. All right, this is a uh, question from Nancy, and she writes, as many of you know, in the UK, it is against the law to have Japanese knotweed on your property. Do you think we could pass a similar law, not only for knotweed, but for some of the others? Is anyone trying to do this? If yes, what persuasive arguments are they using? I don't know of anybody trying to do that here. Uh, I'm not sure we could get something like that passed. Um, so not, not aware of any persuasive arguments that they're using. I think, uh, the reason why, um, I'm not sure if it's against the law to have it on your property, but you can't get a mortgage if you have it on your property. And it's really hard to get homeowners insurance if you have it on your property, because it can be so destructive if it gets in your foundation or your, or your driveway, if you have a paved driveway or something, it can buckle that. So uh, if you have that near your house, that's something to get control of really fast before you suffer the consequences. So um, Rachel, maybe you can answer this question. Someone asked if there is a Northwestern Vermont Sisma. Can you speak to where the other Sismas in Vermont that you know of are? Yeah, there's a sisma in the Northeast Kingdom. It straddles, it's called the U sisma, which is the upper Connecticut River um, invasive species management area. Uh, and that straddles um, Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, it essentially goes from the Canada border um, down towards Jefferson, New Hampshire, and over towards. Um, Concord, Vermont. There's another one over in Orleans County, another sisma that's just started up there. There's another one in the Battenkill River. Um, and then another one, um, Peter. <laughs> this one I never remember. Can you help me out with that one? Sure, yeah. It's the uh, <laughs> Upper White River sisma, Upper White River. Uh, which is in the Bethel area. Yeah. So those are the SISMAs currently in Vermont. And if you Google, um, at least I know that the U SISMA certainly has a, um, a Facebook page and we are very active in, what, in managing invasives and providing programs. And I believe the Orleans County, I'm not sure about the others, they might have a Facebook page. Um, so maybe if, if you Google those uh, SISMAs, you might be able to connect with them. Thank you. Um, all right, Megan asks, any invasives that tend to stick around during the cold winter months? I guess I'm unsure what she means by stick around through the cold winter months. They're all still there. 
uh, with the exception of some of the herbaceous ones like garlic mustard and dame's rocket and gout weed, those things will die back, but all the um, barberry and, and bittersweet and uh, honeysuckle, the woody ones are still hanging out. Um, maybe she could uh, clarify um, what she wants, what she means by the question. And if there's something else related to it, is she trying to figure out wintertime control? Um, Megan, if you're still on, you can unmute and if you want to clarify. Just to add on to my question, more so what tends to make, because you know evergreens, they stay green throughout the winter, kind of like that, more noticeable in the winter time um, than maybe getting drowned in all the other green plants during the summer and springs months. Yeah, I can't think of any that are evergreen that will really stick out. Once you get sort of a, a search image, as it were, of these things, um, you can recognize them in the wintertime pretty easily, like the, the barberry that Jack was talking about with all those sort of arching branches coming out of a central crown. That's pretty, pretty easy to identify. Um, the growth habit of them makes them fairly distinctive, some of them anyway. Certainly the bittersweet that's strangling trees is easy to say. Okay, so um, I just wanted to uh, point out that we are coming close to our official end time of 8 o'clock. And so I just uh, want to remind everyone, Corey, can you please post in the chat the link to the survey and I'm just going to encourage everyone if you could please fill out this survey it would help us figure out uh, what questions or upcoming topics might be of interest to you as as I, we all mentioned this is a new SISMA that has been forming and uh, this is our first foray into educational opportunities we wanted to start with a webinar series considering where we are with the pandemic um, Eventually, we do hope to be moving to offer on-site or field trip based or work days where people can learn by actually going and visiting a site where a lot of these invasive species are. Um, so whether that in the future you have suggestions for what you'd like to see or for another webinar series, if there's topics that are of particular interest to you, we'd love to hear about that also. So officially thank you all for coming we really appreciate the interest and we um, look forward to being able to continue conversations about invasive species both in our backyards and in our woodlots and what are things that we can do as individuals or organizations to help control or manage the spread of them so I think our presenters are able to stay on for a few extra minutes um, and they would be happy to continue answering questions, but I wanted to be conscious of the time so that if some people had to leave, we will continue to record so that um, if you need to leave now, you can always come back and watch the recording. We will send out a recording to everybody who pre-registered uh, for this program. So as soon as it is ready, it, We'll probably take it about a week or so for us to get it officially ready, but we will send it out when uh, it is available. Okay, so I think we have some more questions. Um, all right, here's a question. Is Korean barberry considered invasive? I've been watching a patch of it slowly spread on a wooded property in Chittenden County. I'm not familiar with Korean barberry. I'm not sure if it's different from Japanese barberry. Uh, Tom, have you heard of that? Is it, is it just a different cultivar? Sounds like maybe it's the same thing. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, we should, we should probably be using Latin names, but um, I'm sure it's just a common name for Japanese barbary, something similar. Yeah. But if it looks invasive, it's probably invasive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Barbara has asked, is an autumn olive bush invasive? Oh, bush is growing a lot and should I cut it back? Yes, it's very invasive. It's, a, it's another really heavy cedar. It puts out a ton of fruit. Um, very invasive. Uh, you can try cutting it back. It'll probably re-sprout um, if it's a big one. 
uh, I don't know. Uh, you might have to try a, a cut stump application or something like that to get rid of it. Uh, it's, um, it's not terribly common around here, but it's becoming much more common and spreading pretty fast. Go up to the Woodstock area and it's everywhere. So Stuart asked, um, and I'm not sure, Stuart, if I'm going to capture your question completely correctly. So if you're still on, you can add to it. It says 30% vinegar kills immediately, but the roots? Can you clarify your question? Well, uh, working with some landscaping people and uh, they trying to control uh, plants, uh, even in in the in backyards and paths and so forth they have people have talked in this last year and i've used it this 30 percent vinegar it's uh, comes in a gallon it's rather expensive uh but uh boy it 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 kills everything immediately within a day i'm wondering i guess no none but nobody on the panel is familiar with this but there's a lot there's a lot of uh, yard people, landscaping people that are using this. And so I'm, I've am i seen it. It does kill within a day. It kind of fries the leaves and everything. And I was wondering if it really is a good thing because it's biodegradable, of course, it's vinegar, and if it would kill the roots. Does anybody know about 30% vinegar? I think it's unlikely to kill the roots. It certainly will burn off the foliage and kill that in a hurry. It'll also kill anything else that's acid intolerant that's in that area. Um, so, yeah, it'll kill the, the top part of the plant, but it won't kill the plant. Um, I think we're going to have some interesting conversations during our alternative uh, control methods and our, our chemical control webinars about um, so-called biodegradable or organic or natural control methods. Um, you know, none of them are, are actually, um, or very few of them, I guess I should say, are um, neutral when it comes to the other things growing in, in that area. They're, they're like some of the, the chemicals. Um, they're non-specific. They're going to kill everything that they get sprayed onto. So, um, you have to sort of balance, um, think about what the other things are there and, and um, be careful with what you're using, even if it's natural, um, because you may be having unintended consequences with that as well. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. It does kill everything else around, but if it's on my driveway, uh, that's... Uh, really what, what it's used for, just in the cracks and stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to mention that it, it, I think it will change your the pH of your soil, so you just might be want to be aware of where you're putting it, especially if you use a lot of it. So in terms of treatments, I just wanted to, back in the chat um, earlier on, Rebecca Schrader had mentioned that uh, they have a goat grazing business that helps tackle invasives. And that is going to be something that we talk about um, when we get to the webinar on non-chemical non treatments of invasive plants. And let's see, um, Anne Pierce has mentioned that Korean barberry is Berberis coriana. So that is the Latin name of that one. I've been doing some sleuthing for Anne on the side. So it does not look, I haven't been able to find it listed on any state list, uh, but it does look very similar to common barberry, which is another invasive non-native. Um, it has toothed margins like common barberry. So that might be why it might be going a little bit undetected um, or mistaken for just another invasive. But research continues. And so I just wanted to also point out that there was a comment that, um, you know, like uh, Michael mentioned the, I may not pronounce this correctly, maybe somebody else. El 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 Elegopathic? El uh, El Elignus? Elignus? Oh, I'm butchering that one. 
anyway, the comment was that the fruit of this plant is edible, of this invasive plant is edible. And I think I hear that a lot with invasive species. Um, I hear all the time with knotweed or even with, um, you know, oh, but you can make pesto out of the knotweed or um, with garlic mustard, definitely, you know, pesto with garlic mustard is a favorite. And we could never eat enough of it to get rid of it. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, I think to, I often hear that as a, hey, but it's edible. But the what's counterweighted with that is that it's so much more invasive than the edible quality of it. And so that's something to... I just wanted to point out as it came up in the chat. There was a question early on in the chat. I was going up back up to the top. Uh, somebody asked, let's see. Uh, I think it was Steve Johnson Mosier asked how to eradicate Norway maple. Um, if you've got a big one, a tree company can take it down and grind this grind the stump and you'll be pretty well done with it. Um, if you've got smaller ones, a cut stump chemical application can work. Um, real small ones, like I said, sapling size, a weed ranch, you can pull them out. Um, I know a guy who's over in the Manchester area and is involved with the Battenkill Sisma. He cut a bunch down and then uh, put cans, large cans over the stumps. These were fairly small trees. And so it couldn't stump sprout. The stump sprouts didn't make it, and that took care of those. Um, but you need a fairly specific size tree to make that work. Um, and somebody asked whether they actually get out in the woods, and I've definitely seen them work their way out into the woods. Let's see. Somebody else asked what the problem with goutweed is. The problem with goutweed, from my point of view, is it's so aggressive and it just completely takes over. Um, I think I said at the webinar last time, an ecologist friend of mine said, the only way to get rid of goutweed in your yard is to get yourself a new yard. It is that hard to eradicate. It's so be really careful if you're out there uh, trading plants with folks, um, go to a plant swap or something like that. Be really careful that you're, if possible, get bare root stock, which is what the um, conservation district sells at the spring plant sale. Um, but if you're getting something in a plant swap, boy, be really careful about what you're getting because there may be something that you don't want in that little pot that comes along with whatever plant you're getting. Another thing to be careful about is um, seed packets. Read what's in that seed packet. For instance, uh, Dame's Rocket is still included in some wildlife flower plantings. Um, so be just be aware, be, be uh, uh, an informed consumer. If you're out um, looking at plants, uh, maybe have that BT Invasives website or the Go Botany website on your phone so you can type in the, the Latin name of the plant you're looking at and see whether it's native. Just be careful when you're, when you're getting plants uh, that you're not getting something else that you're going to regret. Peter, um, you've mentioned a couple times um, weed wrenches, and mm -hmm. Chris Olson asked for people who aren't familiar with them, if you could please describe them. Sure. Uh, if you could share your screen and go back to the burning bush slide, we can show people what it is. Okay. Um, it's essentially a big piece of iron with some jaws on the bottom that clamp around um, Oh, that's uh, the wrong. A stem and then gives you the leverage to pull back on that and uproot the plant. Um, actual um, weed wrenches aren't made anymore. There are a couple of different companies that do make a similar thing. There's one called a puller bear uh, that I like because you can put, oh, there we go. So that. That orange thing in my hand there is a weed wrench, and you can see at the bottom, uh, sort of L-shaped, and on the right there, it's grabbing that uh, winged euonymus, and when I pull on that upper part of that 
of the weed wrench, it gives me a lot of leverage and it actually just pulled that plant right out. Um, it's fairly effective. Uh, it's also extremely heavy. You wouldn't want to use this um, for a really dense infestation of some sort of uh, invasive, although I do know of one farmer who cleared, I think, two or three acres of buckthorn under a pine stand so that he could do a timber harvest and not have it just be buckthorn when it was done. But I don't think a lot of people are going to go out and do that. Peter, I have a question. Um, I was thinking about when you were talking about Norway maples. I know that Norway maples, plus some of these other plants that you all have talked about today, um, have a chemical in them that gets into the soils underneath them and keeps other plants from growing. If I was to take down a large Norway maple, how long might that persist in the soil? And is there anything I should do about that? I guess you could test the soil and see if it needed some sort of treatment. I'm not aware of Norway maple's allelopathic capabilities, so I don't know how the soil would be imbalanced. I guess I would suggest get a soil test and see what's missing and do some soil amendment. Um, somebody mentioned in the chat that uh, they thought that a certain invasive plant probably wasn't very good for our insects, and that's certainly true for a number of, of invasive plants, um, which sort of has a knock-on effect for the wildlife value of these things. If the insects aren't there, then the birds aren't there. If it's a plant that's growing over a stream, if the insects aren't there, then the, the fish have degraded habitat in the stream below. Norway maple is one of those. Caterpillars don't really uh, populate Norway maples, so they're not a great um, food source for birds. Um, another thing about Norway maple is the seeds aren't recognized by our mammals as food, so they just leave them alone. Um, so there's a lot of things that, because they don't, they are not originally from here and they don't have all those normal control controls on them, they get out of control. So we potentially may have missed one or two questions in the chat, and we will kind of scroll back through and see if we can find those. But in the meantime, if anyone has any questions and just wants to unmute themselves and jump in and ask, you're welcome to. Uh, Chris Morgan said he typically, typically tackles buckthorn in the late autumn uh, because it's the last plant to lose its leaves. They apply Roundup to the trunk, but often it regenerates in the spring. Um, it could be that it's just too late in the year for that kind of application. Um, I'm not sure. Tom would probably know better. Fall is, is a really good time to do cut stump treatments. Um, there's, you know, depending on what you're doing, if you're using a handsaw or a chainsaw, if you flay that cambium on the outside and you don't end up treating it completely around, um, the potential for sprouting is greater. Um, if you're not using the right concentration, like um, who, I don't remember who it was, it was so, said they were using an 18% concentration. That might not be enough because you're, it's a surface area equation. So if your stump is this big, um, you have to use a higher concentration of herbicide as opposed to spraying uh, a plant with all of its leaves on it. Um, the surface area of all those leaves is going to be much greater. So you can get more herbicide more effectively into that plant and then into the root system to kill it. Um, personally, for my treatments, I would much rather spray a plant with foliage on it um, as a foliar application than do a cut stump treatment. It's just more effective in the end. So Chris said that he was doing it in late fall. I don't know what that means. How late would you... Uh, still do a cut stump application? Um, the reason why fall is a great spring, you, you can't do a cut stump because the sap is running up into the plant, using that energy to put out leaves. In the fall, it's taking everything back down into the root system, so it makes, it makes that treatment more effective. Um, and say your question one more time, sorry. Is there a time in the fall when it's too late to do that? So as soon as sort of snow hits the ground, freezing temperatures, um, that stops it because you, the solution in your application device is not going to be 
um, really getting into that plan at that point. So I think of it as like November. Um, you know, maybe if you're in Eastern Massachusetts, it might be a little bit longer than that, but um, if there's snow on the ground and it's freezing temperatures, it's pretty much the end of the season for that. How do you get rid of horsetail? Uh, I guess I wouldn't get rid of horsetail. It's a native and it's a really important floodplain plant. So I guess I would leave it. Hi, this is Jack Witness. I just, uh, can you hear me? You can, Jack. You can, Jack. So I just wanted to make a comment, and maybe you've touched on this. I came in late, what Peter was saying about uh, bugs and uh, invasives. Um, the uh, second most common cause of uh, loss of species worldwide is invasives, whether it's plants or animals. So this is a really uh, important item to know about in terms of uh, the damage that they do. If you want to read more about it, uh, Half Earth uh, talks about this in, in great detail by E.O. Wilson. Wonderful. And on that note, um, thank you all for coming again this evening. It really encouraging to see so many people interested in invasive species as a topic and wanting to know how to manage these different species. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you at future events. Um, the next one is coming up in two weeks.